You know what? I certainly have been enjoying these throwback messages. I, I told you a few weeks ago, one of the dilemmas that have, uh, not really a dilemma, a challenge on the inside of me is that when God began to very graciously, and I'm so grateful to him, expand our ministry, the, the sphere of our influence by letting us not be just East Coast, but now East Coast and West Coast, that I had these people who have heard many years of what I preached and I had another group that God had opened up their hearts to me and had never really heard anything I've ever taught. And so I committed in myself to let my messages be fresh and new so that I'm ever learning, I'm ever in the presence of God, my prayer life is consistent and up to date. But every once in a while, I'll sneak a little opportunity in to grab one that I know had a significant impact and just speak it. And these last few weeks in the throwback series, I've been able to do that. This will be the last one. <laughs> this will be the last one in the throwback series. And we put the little cassette tape on here <laughs> because we made so many of those things, especially in the early and, and mid late nineties. And then CDs became a little more prominent, but uh, I had books and books and books and books of cassettes and uh, do a little promo right here. But uh, for those of you who would like to hear the archive of 32, ministry, 32 years of ministry and preaching, I have it in something called The Vault. You can go to my website or the church website. And uh, everything that I've ever preached, we are digitally remastering it from even the old cassette tapes and putting it in the vault so that whatever you need, you can build your faith in that area. I would love for you to go to the website and check it out. Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. <laughs> Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. Now it happened the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd. Verse 12. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin and those who carried him stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he who presented him and excuse me and presented him to his mother, then fear came upon all and they glorified God saying, a great prophet has risen up among us and God has visited his people. And this report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding region. Lord, I'm asking you now to bless the reading of your word and let it minister in a powerful way. Let it change the hearer's life in Jesus' name. Amen. Tell your neighbor on both sides. Here we go, neighbor. There is a principle in the Bible that I think is one of the most powerful principles. Genesis is the most fascinating book because it is the book of first things. There are things that happen in Genesis that transcend Old Covenant and New Covenant. They are God's original intent. When I talk about what God wants for man, I go back to Adam. What did God originally intend? A lot of people think that tithing is a part of the law or the Old Testament. Tithing started in the Garden of Eden. It was God's original intent. It's called the law of divine portion, meaning that God always keeps a portion for himself and then he commands his people not to eat it. So he kept the two trees in the garden, said, you can have all of it, but these are mine. When he built the tabernacle, he said, you can have the outer court and the inner court. The holiest of holies is mine. When he had all the 12 tribes of, of uh, Israel, he said, every, each and every one of you can own land, but the Levites minister unto me in the tabernacle. They are mine. Come on. So when we get our income, God says the 90% is yours, but 10% is mine. There are so many things in the book of Genesis that are the beginning of God's original intent that transcend the covenants. They move through the years and it was what God originally intended for man that Adam lost and, Je and Jesus, the second Adam or the last Adam, has restored unto us. Hallelujah. One of those principles in Genesis is this. Whenever God, stay with me now, whenever God wants something, he doesn't speak to the thing he wants. 
He speaks to the thing that holds it and commands it to let it go. <clears throat> let me say that again. Whenever God wants something, he doesn't call the thing he wants. He speaks to the thing that holds it and tells the thing that holds it to let it go. For instance, God didn't come to earth and say, let there be grass and let there be potatoes and let there be tomatoes and let there be corn and let there be beans and let there be cucumbers. He said, let the earth, let the earth bring forth every seed that is in it. So in other words, God did not speak to the vegetables and the fruits. God spoke to the earth that held the seed and told the earth to give up its potential. So so the potential for fruit and food was already in the earth. He speaks to what holds it and tells what holds it to let it go. Hallelujah. So then we come back to this right here. We go, Jesus didn't, God didn't come back and say, let there be red snapper, let there be sea bass, and let there be grouper. He said, let the waters bring forth the fish and every sea creature that was already in it. So God did not speak to every species of fish. He spoke to the water, which had the potential for fish, and told the water to give up what is on the inside of you. God didn't say, let there be Saturn, Jupiter, Uranus, Mars, Earth. He said, let the heavens bring forth. And why? Because the planets, the moon, and the stars were all of heaven's potential. And God just told the heavens to let loose, to let go of what was already in them. Hallelujah. I'm feeling this. So when you get to me and you, a lot of you think that you started when your mother and father came together, or that I started when my mother and father came together. But you didn't start when your mother and father came together. Your mother and father gave the real you a body. But the Bible says you are you are chosen in Christ before the foundations of the earth. And so what that means is you didn't come from them. You came from God. So when God wanted you, he spoke to himself. And when he spoke to himself, you came out and I came out because all of us were God's potential. In the beginning was God and nothing else. So everything that is now came out of him. Hallelujah. So your mom and daddy gave you a flesh suit to live in, but you, the life you, the life principle came out of God. So whenever God wants a thing, he speaks to what holds it. Let the earth, let the seed go. And let the waters, let the fish go. Let the heavens bring forth the stars. And when God wanted us, he spoke to himself. God doesn't speak to what he wants. He speaks to what holds it and tells it to turn it loose. Somebody raise your hand in the air for five seconds and shout, turn it loose. Come on, somebody. Say, turn it loose. Shout, turn it loose. Mm. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ah, it's too early for that. You're going to push me too hard. So what does that have to do with the widow at Nain who lost her only son? I'm glad you asked. <coughs> there was a processional. And in Hebrew custom, I know this seems like a weird custom, that, but there were professional mourners that literally people could be paid to mourn. And so evidently there is this caravan of a mother, family members, loved ones, and mourners who are following the coffin of a mother who was a widow who had just lost her only son. Okay? So she's already been widowed, and the only one she had left was her son, and he has perished. So this caravan comes into the presence of Jesus. Mm. There's so much I could preach there. Because in the presence of Jesus, everything has the ability to change. And so it was the same, and it did not change till it came into the presence of Jesus. When Jesus came up, and I'm going to make a long story short because there's a lot I want to tell you in a short amount of time. Jesus went up and said, do not weep. Why? Don't weep because do you understand who's standing in your midst? And the thing that is making you troubled and sad, I have the ability to change. I came to tell somebody that you don't need to cry another tear over some of these things because the thing that is making you so sorrowful right now that the, in the presence of Jesus, God has the power to change it. Those of you that worship, your worship was not in vain. Those of you that praised God, your praise was not in vain. Those of you that even though your heart was hurting, you gave God your hands, your lips, your mouth, your praise anyway. Let me tell you something. In the presence of the Lord is fullness 
of joy. Yeah. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. When you have the presence of God, everything painful in your life has the ability to turn around and has the ability to be changed. Can somebody say amen? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Jesus went up and he did not touch the boy. What principle did I just show you out of Genesis? When God wants a thing, he doesn't speak to the thing. He speaks to the thing that holds it and tells what is holding it to let it go. <clears throat> he walks up to the coffin. Jesus never touched the boy. He touched the thing that was holding the boy. The coffin was the restraint of the boy's potential. And Jesus spoke to the restraint and told the restraint to let the boy go. I'm gonna try not to run right through this screen and just get you right there where you are. Is it possible today that God is not touching the thing that you need him to touch, but he's touching the thing, holding the thing. Hallelujah. Could it be possible that it's not the money, but God's going to touch the thing that is restraining the money? Could it be that it's not peace, but it's going to be the thing in your household or your life that is restraining the peace? Could it be that he's not going to touch the joy, but he's going to speak to the thing that is restraining the joy? Could it be that God is not just going to speak to the relationship, but he's going to speak to the thing that is restraining the relationship. Whatever God wants, many times there the enemy sets up a restraint against it. Even in creation, God looked at every element of creation and said, let there be, let there be, let there be. What does that mean? He says, let it. In other words, it seemed as though something was restraining it. But when God said, let, he command whatever restraints there was to let it go. Let there be light and there was light. So whatever restraint was holding it back God spoke to the restraint and it came forth whatever God wanted God speaks to the thing that's holding the thing that you need in your life let the word of the Lord come to you today and I want you to know whatever your coffin is Jesus is going to touch your coffin before I get through preaching today I prophetically declare it in Jesus name shout hallelujah shout hallelujah thank you Jesus yay Woo! Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now, Colossians 3. I got to get going. Colossians 3. <clears throat> 1 through 3. If you then, if, excuse me, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. <laughs> Seek those things which are above, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. There's so much here. Go back to verse one, if you would, please. <clears throat> if you then were raised with Christ, what is Christ? Anybody who's been following me any amount of time, I have driven this like nails into our spirit. The word Christ is not Jesus' last name. It is descriptive of his function. He is Christ the anointing. Jesus the, the Christ, Jesus the anointing, Jesus the anointed one and his anointing. The word Christ means anointing. You say, well, all right, that's good. I know what Christ means, but what does anointing mean? Anointing is descriptive of the Holy Spirit taking residence in a person. So if I were to come up to you after a message, after you gave your testimony, after you prayed, after you sung a song and said, man, that was anointed, <clears throat> what I'm saying is I recognized the spirit of God on your life when that was taking place. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. So to be anointed is to have the Holy Spirit resident in your life. 
I tell people, Jesus, the man, came, died, rose again, went back into heaven and sits at the right hand of God and there he may ever makes intercession for you and me. I'll talk about that with you next week. But the Christ never left the earth. The anointing, the Holy Spirit stayed in the earth and settled on the next body of Christ, which is us. So Acts chapter two in the upper room when they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, that was the Holy Spirit, the Christ, the anointing moving from the physical body of Jesus to the spiritual body of Jesus. And you and I, whew, God, we are the body of Christ. We are the body of the anointing. Now, if you then were raised in the anointing, seek those things which are above where the anointing is. Verse two, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Let me stop right there. <laughs> set your mind on things above. Uh, I tell you what, go on to 1 John 2.20. I gotta, I gotta somehow wind all this stuff together. But you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. You have an anointing from the Holy One. You only, I've not written you because you do not know, but because you know it. And there's no lie in the truth. Go back to verse 20. Go back to verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. Now go back to Colossians 3 and verse 1. You have an anointing, and you know all things. The Bible says that now when I get filled with the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes and takes up residence in me, and Ron Carpenter becomes anointed by the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that inside that residency, inside of that anointing, that I know all things. So in other words, ah, the Holy Spirit inside of you knows everything about you. We know our past, we know our present, and we're clueless about our future. But the Spirit of God comes from heaven and eternity into time and lives on the inside of Ron. <laughs> Pardon me. And when he gets on the inside of Ron, he says, Ron, I am here and I know who you were. I'm here and I know what you're experiencing, but also know who God called you to be. And the Bible says when the Spirit of truth comes in John 16, he said he will be your guide. I want to tell you something. If the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, you have an anointing and that anointing knows everything about you. I am amazed and mystified at all the preachers that talk about next and future and destiny and purpose but do not talk about the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the only one that knows my destiny. He's the only one that knows my purpose. He's the only one that knows my future. How in the world preacher, teacher, pastor are you going to tell me what my future is? Life coach, if you're going to take me into my future, you don't know my future. The only person that knows my future is the Holy Spirit. You may be able to give me externals that give me a disciplined life, but the fact is if I'm ever going to become who God wants me to be, it's because the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of me and he's my God that takes me there. Somebody lift up your hands and give God praise in this building. Shout hallelujah. Hey, hallelujah. Ah, uh, you got to quit, man. I'm feeling this thing. Now, you have an anointing. If then you were raised in this anointing, seek those things which are above where the anointing is. Most people don't seek out their anointing. I'm not sure we in this generation know anything about seeking, period. Seeking is a consistent, passionate, constant pursuit. And we seek our careers and we seek money and we seek success. But we don't seek things above where the anointing is. Your anointing knows everything about you. And you are now being commanded to become a seeker of that anointing. To have a relationship with your anointing, the Holy Spirit. To know the mind of your anointing. The Bible says we have the mind of Christ. That is the mind of the anointing. So you have an anointing <clears throat> that knows everything about you. But the Bible doesn't say that, that you know everything in your head. 
It says you know everything in your anointing. Dilemma is your head is where you make your decisions. When you get saved, you have the mind. The flesh is sending it a signal and your spirit is sending it a signal. The Bible says for me to seek out this spirit side. How do you do that? It's based in Romans 8 on what you sow to. He who sows to the flesh will thereof reap corruption. He who sows to the spirit will have life and have peace. Sowing to means focus on and giving attention to. So if I'm constantly giving attention to what my flesh wants, there will always be corruption. But if I'm constantly giving attention to what the Spirit of God wants, it's life and peace. What does that mean, life? That means I'm living the life that God intended for me to live instead of being over here in my flesh guessing what he has next. God Almighty. Ron, that's good preaching. That's good preaching. <laughs> Set your, excuse me, verse 2. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. So now he says, you have been raised in the anointing. Go to verse three. I hadn't even read verse three yet. I apologize. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Oh, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. I no longer live but Christ lives in me. When I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, Ron, the man of the flesh, dies. And now Christ, the anointing, lives in me. The Bible says if I've been raised with Christ, been raised with the anointing, come on, this ain't milk, this is meat. If I've been raised in the anointing, then I need to set my mind on the things where that anointing is. I talked to you a little bit about of mind world a couple of weeks ago because if you're stuck, you're stuck in your mind. <laughs> you're stuck in your mind. God. I'm going to tell you something. <clears throat> These throwback messages, I feel the weight of this, this word. God, just do your work right now in the listener who just feels stuck and clueless about their tomorrow, feels lost and confused. I thank you that right now direction comes by the power of the anointing of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Come on, say amen to that. Say amen to that. So the Bible says, set your mind on things above where Christ is. For you died and your life is hidden in the anointing. So God has taken Ron Carpenter's life, everything he was meant to do, everything he was meant to be, everything he was meant to accomplish, and everything that he has the potential to become, and he hid it in my anointing. Your God hides things. Salvation is easy. The kingdom is hidden. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High God. The Bible says when you pray, Pray in secret. The Bible says in what you pray in secret, God will reward openly. Come on, somebody. The Bible talks about the mystery of Christ and the church, the mystery of marriage. Of course, you knew that again anyway. God hides things. The Bible says that who you really are is not hidden in what somebody else can tell you. It's hidden in your anointing. But the only way I can live that out, the only way that can flesh itself out is to take my mind and set it on things above where the anointing is, where Christ is. Now, that word set, give me a few more minutes. I'm going to land this plane. That word set is a medical term for like setting a bone that has been broken. Okay. Okay. I was always told, I broke, I think it was 18 bones growing up. And I was always told, I don't know if they just did it to try to comfort you while you're there getting your cast put on, knowing you're going to have that thing on you for two or three months. <laughs> but I was always told that the bone that had been broken when they set it would come back stronger than it previously was. So God is taking a medical term uh, as setting a bone and saying, set your mind so God is already presupposing your mind is broken. 
In other words, your mind does not think along the lines of the real you. It's broken. So I've got to take my mind and set it on things above where Christ is. Now, my anointing knows who I am. My mind ate from that tree, the knowledge of good and evil. And the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. So in other words, my outcomes, my reality, the issues in my life have been a product of my thinking. The whole time the Holy Spirit is on the inside of you screaming, I know who you really are. I know what you can really do. I'm the one that knows your potential. <laughs> I'm the one that knows where you should be at this point in your life. I'm the one that should be picking your friends. I'm the one that should be choosing your career. I'm the one that should be choosing your mate. I know everything about you. And the Holy Spirit is screaming to get out of where he is on the inside of you and help you live the life that God planned. But our mind is unfruitful. And the Bible says that the carnal mind, that means the fleshly mind, the unrenewed mind, the Bible says it is the enemy of God. It is not subject to God, nor can it be. So we've got a Holy Ghost that knows who exactly who we are, but we We've got a mind that is not subject to it. So now the Holy Ghost is here and knows me, but my mind is not there. So it's not whether or not you're anointed. Quit telling me, man, I got a powerful anointing. I got a great anointing on my life. It's not are you anointed? Of course you're anointed. I'm anointed. Everybody's anointed the same. It's can you think on the level of your anointing? Because when you can line your mind up with what God has on the inside of you, then if any to agree in the earth it shall be done by my father which is in heaven I feel like preaching this thing right where you are somebody needs to reach out and grab this truth for your life right now because God is about to take the crooked places and make them straight confusion go in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth somebody shout hallelujah in this place hey hallelujah 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 Hallelujah. All right, let me finish up here. Let me finish up. Tell the people if you got anybody in the room where you say, don't leave now, don't leave now. Romans 12, 1 and 2. <laughs> and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Keep that up there. You already, remember, he, you need to set your mind because it's broken. Where is it broken? It is conformed to the worldly way of living. Fleshly desires. Humanistic ambitions. Do not have your mind there, but transform. That word transform is metamorpho, from which we get metamorphosis, which is the process of a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. In other words, go into the word one way, come out something totally different. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may, be a, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I've already been up here a half hour, Terrence, if you would, just play something for me. I gotta land this plane. <clears throat> Don't leave your broken mind in conform conformation to a worldly system, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind is what Jesus called taking it and washing it with the water of the Word. The Word uproots mindsets that are contrary and it plants the mindset that will allow your spirit to lead your life. Look at what he says that you may be able to prove. That word prove in the Greek means allow. That you may be able to allow what is that good, pleasing, and acceptable will of God. Where's the will of God? He's hidden my life in the anointing. 
okay? The will of God is right here. The Holy Spirit knows everything about my life. There's another scripture I was gonna read, I didn't do it. The Bible says 1 Corinthians in the 10 and 11. He said, for who knows a man except the spirit of a man within him? And who knows God except the spirit of God? Nobody knows God like the Holy Spirit and nobody knows you like your spirit. So my life is hidden in my spirit. Now I've got to take my mind who makes the choice and life is choice driven. Now I've got to take my mind and renew it and wash it with the water of the word and plant seeds in my mind that are in alignment with what God has in my spirit. And the word prove means allow. Renew your mind so that your mind will allow the will of God. The carnal, the fleshly, the worldly mind fights the will of God. Some of you are not battling a devil, you're battling a carnal mind. And God has so many things in your spirit that he desires for you to do, but your mind is fighting it, fighting it. So your spirit says, I want you to prosper and your mind keeps you in poverty. And your spirit says, I want you to come alive and live a life of joy, Zoe life, a life abundantly, but your mind keeps you fearful and depressed. So I've got to renew it so that when this comes up, the carnal mind doesn't beat it back down. But the mind of the spirit allows me to live it because as a man thinketh in his heart and what he receives to be true, so is he. Hallelujah. Would you put your hands together right there where you are and just give God some praise. This isn't a message where I can lay hands on you or call you to an altar and renew your mind. This is a seek. A day by day seeking. Renewing your mind to find out what God has put in your spirit that is a marvelous, marvelous life exceedingly abundantly above and beyond what you could ask or think. I charge you today to become a seeker of those things which are above. May I bless you before you go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. May God Almighty himself establish you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I can't wait to see you again next week. Have the best week you've ever had. God bless you.